Hello, heads, and welcome back to Working Man's Pod. I'm Alex, and I'm joined by Dave. Dave, how you doing? We're good, man. We're uh, we're working professionals today. In a in a button down and a polo, uh, we're keeping Working Man's Pod classy. We're keeping it for the working man. So yeah, this is our second and likely second of three. I'm gonna guess of our from the vault series. Um, which is, it's fitting. That's just like the Grateful Dead's from the Vault series. They had volumes one, two, and three. This one, Dave, we decided to release an older episode of ours that we think is just underrated. It's it's been slept on. The listenership has not been as high as we think it should have been. And so we're re-releasing it to the masses. And just a different kind of episode. I mean, when we, when we were going back and forth and thinking about what we should do next, not not that we were in disagreement, but we were both throwing around different shows. And then it never crossed my mind to re-release the interviews um, that we've done. But you brought up the great idea to re-release the one with uh, Justin Kreutzman. And it's great for for the new the new fans to Working Man's Pod to see that, I mean, hands down, the most famous person that we've spoken to. Absolutely. Uh, but also to like, kind of see a different style of episode and you know not fall into the same routine and and see something different yeah and we like to keep things fresh around fresh around here right we have different types of episodes and one of them is interviews as dave just said the justin kreutzman interview that we recorded last year is definitely my favorite interview that we have recorded and released and i to this day just remain very humbled and grateful pardon the pun, to Justin that he spent some time with us. I, in preparation for us re-recording this intro, re-watched Let There Be Drums last night. And god damn, is it a good documentary. Yeah, that was one of the more fun episodes to prep for because that documentary is really well done. And just getting to like watch that as homework, air quotes for this, was was excellent. Yeah, go go watch Let There Be Drums. I found it on Amazon Prime, um, so that's where I consumed it but go watch it support justin and and see it's not just a documentary about billy and mickey there's so much more to it and it as we're as you're gonna hear us ask him about it really turned into a more thematic story about family and how drumming can kind of bring family together or break them apart so yeah right so yeah i I watched it on Amazon Prime as well. And because I bought it back when it came out, I'm not sure if it's like included with Prime at this point or if if it's just still in my library because I own it. But yeah, either way, you can rent it there at the very least. It's probably not very expensive. And it is a great documentary, as Dave said, um, giving his little um, kind of high level description of what it's about. But it's so well made. And you can support Justin. He's a great artist. He's done a lot of really, really good work in the documentary space. And so it's cool to support him and also to support the family of a man, Bill Kreutzman, who has brought us all so much joy over the years. Um, it's really a nice way to to give back and support Justin's, you know, his own path because he he really has like really kind of made his own way, which is I yeah. think so cool and so admirable that he you know, he's done his own thing. And in the doc, you learn about other drummers, like I think most notably Jason Bonham, who have followed in their father's footsteps and made a path of their own in drumming. But it's cool too, that Justin had, you know, he found this other art form that he kind of gravitated toward and, and has taken it to, you know, really the highest levels with, you know, getting a a documentary made, which uh, is no small feat whatsoever. So um, with that being said, uh, any other things that you wanted to talk about before we kick it to that old episode, Dave? I just wanted to reminisce with you on, do you remember when you were like, not nervous, but you were just exclaimed to me that like, oh my God, we had to get an email through his publicist, <laughs> which was new for both of us. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Um, I do remember that. It's funny that I've I've actually thought about it since then about like reaching back out to that publicist to be like, hey, just wanted to let you know, like, this is how many people have listened to the episode. I hope that it's like helped with the movie. But I will admit we our audience was still very much growing back then. And I think that this re-release will probably get more listenership than the last one. Uh, and that's all because of you, the masses. So thank you guys for continuing to support us. Uh, August was the first month that we have 
you know, now had data from since the Dead & Co months where we had really like massive listenership because we were doing so many shows and there was so much, you know, kind of new content coming out with the Dead & Company tour. And our listenership has stayed extremely steady throughout the month, which is, you know, very flattering. And it's, I mean, it's really cool to have you have you guys all on the bus with us and uh, and listening to what we're doing. I promise that we are going to be back with full episodes soon. I'll give you a little life update from the two of us and why we're on this you know more extended hiatus than last year. We're both in the process of moving across the country right now to di- to different places. You know, different lengths of move, but it doesn't make it any less stressful for either of us. We're both in the throes of it. We've got mm-hmm. you know because we're moving to different cities, job searches and housing searches and all that stuff. So we just we just need a little bit more time to kind of get that stuff into a place where it's a little bit more settled and we can have enough time to fully dedicate ourselves to come out with, you know, full whole episodes that that we want to put out. So I'm not certain if two weeks from now we'll be back with a third from the vault. I suspect that we will be. If not, it would probably be a WP and 30, a shorter one, maybe about Oxomoxo, which is the next kind of album deep dive that we that we owe. But some great news in the meantime is that a new season of the good old Grateful Dead cast is out. This one is back to their roots. If you listen to it from the beginning, their first two seasons were album deep dives about American Beauty and Working Man's Pod um, in reverse order. So Working Man's Pod, there was working, an episode. Working Man's Dead, right? Jesus. We're, they didn't do one about us. Yeah, not, not yet. yet. <laughs> maybe maybe next year. <laughs> so yeah, sorry. Uh, the first one was about Working Man's Dead, and then the next one was about American Beauty. And in each of those first two seasons, they took a song-by-song approach where they did a deep dive into each song. Amazing content. Go back and listen to it if you haven't already. But right now they're doing that for the 50th anniversary of Wake of the Flood. The first episode came out last week about Mississippi Half Step, Uptown Tootaloo, and I would imagine that they'll be coming every week for the next few weeks. So you've got plenty of Grateful Dead content. Also, go listen to our friend Howard Weiner, his new podcast, Deadology. He's coming out with episodes very regularly, and those have been great so far. So um, there's plenty of content out there for you to to listen to while we, you know, get our our lives together and figure out what's next for Dave and I. Uh, we'll we'll give some updates on that when we have them. But in the meantime, uh, let's let's kick it to our episode with Justin Kreutzman. Enjoy it, and we will talk to you in two weeks. We're joined today by Justin Kreutzman, a, a true filmmaker. He is a director, a writer, producer, cinematographer, editor of a wide variety of projects, including many that our audience of Deadheads will love, like Grateful Dog, Move Me Brightly, Fare Thee Well, Blackberry Smoke with Bobby Weir, The Other One, and most recently, Let There Be Drums, which is a great documentary about drummers, their families, and the art of drumming. It's available now. You can rent it and buy it on Amazon, on Apple, other streaming platforms. Um, and it it just it's a great documentary. It features interviews from so many legendary drummers, too many to list, and many of their children. And um, so Deadheads who are listening to this right now, there's a whole lot of Grateful Dead content in there as well. So if you haven't watched it yet, you should pause this right now and go watch, and we'll be here for you when you're done. Justin, welcome. We're so excited to have you today. What do you mean pause? Like pause before I even start talking. Like, you know, yeah, don't bother. <laughs> just listen to, to listen to my intro. Don't even bother listening to the interview. Just pause it. In fact, yeah, no, that, that was very nice. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah. No, I was thinking of it like um, when DVDs used to rule the world and I would watch a movie and then I'd watch the director's commentary. So they should go watch the documentary and then come back for the director's commentary here. They'll go deeper, dive deeper into the film. Totally, because you sure aren't getting any director's commentary on, like on the DVD we released of Let There Be Drums. I didn't even know they made DVDs anymore. I was like really surprised. And you know, like we have like zero bonus content. So I guess they still make them, but they just don't put that much into it. So you know, if, you, if you need a good stocking stuffer, just don't uh, don't go for the bonus clips because, you know, it ain't going to happen. OK, fair enough. So that actually makes me think about this question. Have you seen this film in a movie theater yet? I have. I have. Nice. Uh, we had an L.A. Right on. premiere on Thursday, October 27th. That was okay. very nice. 
And uh, it had been a minute since I, I actually watched the movie and to watch it with a crowd, be it a crowd of invited guests, friends and family. So, you know, it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't expecting anyone to really, you know, put up a fight to watch it. But, you know, they laughed mostly in the right places and, you know, they they oohed and awed and mostly in the right places. And um, <laughs> yeah, that was that was all the good stuff. And my kids were there and my wife and, you know, um, Adrian Young from No Doubt was uh, did the Q&A with me. That's so, awesome. yeah, that that was that was fun. And uh, tomorrow I'm doing another one in the Bay Area. Uh, I don't know when this airs, but on November 5th, I'm doing another one in the Bay Area. Yeah, so that'd I- be fun. I, I retweeted something about that earlier today from our account. This is going to come out on Tuesday, so that will have already happened. And so I will um, congratulate you for a successful one um, on Saturday in the Bay. So, it was amazing. It was totally amazing. I, I, I never had such an amazing time in the future. It was great. You know, it was crazy that the fact that they awarded you an Oscar during that event was just <laughs> wild. I couldn't believe when I read about that. That was crazy. But. And and the fact that they like, you know, said, you know, we're, we're, we're discounting every other documentary and the most like competitive documentary category in the world just to make <laughs> yeah. your film about rock and roll where nobody actually dies in it. So, you know, like that, that, that I found really, really amazing. So, it was nice. Know. Yeah. They had Brett Morgan give it to you, um, even though his documentary Moon Age Daydream also came out this year. It was just a lovely affair. So. Yeah, well, you know, Brett, <laughs> Brett, Brett, Brett's a good guy. Brett's for, he's actually really interesting. I emailed Brett like just out of the blue, I think when he did the Stones movie or maybe. Yeah, it was definitely before he had done the Kurt Cobain movie or maybe he was working on that. And like he wrote back to me and he's like, yeah, this is kind of funny. I'm actually in one of your films. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying, <laughs> trying the world to figure out how Brett Morgan is in one of my films. He's like, yeah, you know, when you were shooting that making of Touch of Grey stuff, I was in the crowd at Laguna Seca watching them shoot the music video. No way. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, he's like, yeah, I love the Grateful Dead. I'm like, wow. Okay, cool. And uh, so we've been fast friends ever since. That is crazy. What a small world we live in. Man. Well, that was a that was a perfect key up. You just totally segued right into that story very nicely. I, I know. Without I can't even knowing it. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully we get some more <laughs> of that uh, throughout this conversation. So I'd like to begin with kind of your childhood adventures in filmmaking because there are some clips in in the film in Let There Be Drums that I understand are like that you shot on a Super 8 back in the day, which is so cool and art, really artfully used throughout the movie. When did you begin shooting things like that, uh, like whether backstage or at your house or things things of that nature? Oh, it was, you know, it was... Um... Christmas night, you know, and, and that's the great thing about getting it, getting a camera for, for an event, you have the document of the actual time you did it. So <laughs> it was Christmas 1977. And, and anybody who is as old as I am, I mean, I got an Atari, a lightsaber and a super eight camera. Like wow, it was, wow. a, that was like the best Christmas I think I've ever had. Like life <laughs> was good. And you know, yeah. like from that moment on, I just started shooting and hitting people with the lightsaber. So it was like, <laughs> It was game on. Um, yeah. And I just started shooting that, you know, and I think the Winterland, the, you know, the New Year's Eve Winterland run, boy, was it probably started just days after Christmas. I would, mm-hmm. I would assume something like, I don't know. I don't remember how many shows they did that year, but that was the first um, dead shows that I went to and you bring the camera. And so like, you know, it's really dark footage of me backstage in those tiny little dressing rooms at Winterland. Uh, yeah, I used a little bit, little bits here and there because, you know, we always, uh, dad and I always shot stuff. In fact, <laughs> dad and I and Mickey Hart did, um, we decided like we were going to write, shoot, uh, and do the set design on like this, this, this crazy story that Mickey had about this cursed drum. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's like the one, I don't know where, whatever happened to the footage, but it's like, I mean, I think we did the whole film in about two hours, but it was really, it was really, it was called the Rinpoche. I remember the title and it's a true story of a cursed drum that like Owsley had brought back and presented to Mickey and he would give it to members of the Grateful Dead and any member of the Grateful Dead that had it had really bad, like Phil got in a car accident. You know, there's all this, all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's actually a really interesting story. We just you know, like, hey, we got nothing to do for like an hour. Let's make a full on movie with sets and dad and Mickey playing various <laughs> characters. <laughs> anyway, you know, it, the, the, you know, that, I think I got lost in the ages or dad destroyed it. I'm not quite sure. But um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that for a while. But that was that was the kind of stuff we were doing around the Kreutzmann house with the, uh, the early Super 8. Yeah, that's that's excellent. So then what age do you remember? Do you remember? Maybe you don't. 
an age where you were like, you know, I think I could do this. Like, I think I could make this my career um, being you well, know, a I'm filmmaker. still not so certain. It really, I, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm still sort of on the fence whether this was a good idea or not. Uh, it, it's something I've always wanted to do. And I'm not smart enough to have like a fallback or, or try to be good at <laughs> something else. So I really put all my all my eggs in the, in the filmmaking basket. Um, and, you know, it's it's so far it's, it's doing OK for me. I just, um, you know, when you grow up around like, I mean, this, this is not just the Grateful Dead. And um, this just happens to be the band that I grew up around. Mm-hmm. I mean, you were encouraged to if you believed in it if, it, if you felt like, you know, this was your calling to just pursue it no matter what it was. Um, just try to, you know, if you're going to do it, you got to do it right. If, if you're serious about it, which doesn't mean you can't have fun doing it, but like, you know, that's why I, I think I never really wanted to be a musician because I just, the, the bar was sort of so high. Like <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, you could sit around and play proud Mary and just, yeah, I got this, you know? I mean, I, 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 I it was first a blip because I found this is, this is such a rock and roll story. I opened the closet once in our house and there was this Gibson SG and nobody knew where it came from. It just was in our closet. So I started plucking around on it and I just, the mere mention that I may be interested, like Bob Weir wrote out chord charts for me and Phil Esch was like correcting oh, me no on way. how you play black Peter with like the B7. And I'm just like, <laughs> already this seems like a lot of work. Like all right, and it turns out the guitar was that old one of Weir's that you see in those old pictures in the early seventies that, that when he hit played the SG oh. and he had left it at our house. So I gave it back, like, oh, hey Bob, I think this is yours. He's like, oh, I was wondering where that went. Some sort of like classic rock and roll instrument that was just like left around. But yeah, anyway, wow. I, I, I digress. No, that's that's really cool. It makes sense too. When I, I understand what you're saying about like it is kind of maybe just people who grow up around artists in general, where it's like if you have a passion for art, just go for it. But it does seem like the dead are uniquely that way with members of the greater family starting a travel agency to book the dead's travel and things like that, where it's like, hey, if you're passionate about this, just go for it. You know, we'll we'll help support you. You know, that's it's a pretty cool, uniquely supportive environment, I would say. What two two films I've heard you or read read about you uh, talking about are Apocalypse Now, which uh, there's a really great segment about it in the film, um, and then um, Blue Velvet. What are some films that were influential on you when you were, you know, a young person trying to figure out, you know, kind of what your voice or what you wanted to do with with filmmaking? Well, I mean, Apocalypse Now is 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 what made me want to figure out what a filmmaker did and and how you do that and what the process was like just by Dad and Mickey being involved in the the percussion underscore as as you know, and the story's in the movie and and you hear all that. And that was, you know, in the Coppola's, I mean, just, it was equally as inspiring to be around Francis Coppola and his family and then see the amazing work that they did. And just, you know, it was all cool at all. Like it was like the whole package. You're like, wow, I, I don't, you know, I don't really know what this guy's doing, but it's really intense. And that was also the year, um, this is 77 when they're still making the movie that star Wars and close encounters came out. So mm. like bet- between like, you know, watching Apocalypse be made, watching Star Wars, watching Close Encounters. So, you know, ob- obviously I'm not like, a, a, you know, a French New Wave kind of like, you know, I'm into <laughs> Spielberg, Lucas Coppola, pretty, you know, like, you know. I, and David Lynch, like, though. That's more well, avant-garde. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, David Lynch, I, that, that's, that, that's, I blame Jerry for that one. And I totally remember how this happened because we were making In the Dark at Marin Vets. And it was like. Um, you know, and it was, it was after the period after Jerry's coma, and he was like suddenly Captain Sociable. He's like, "Hey, you guys want to go out and do something tonight?" So Dad and I go over to Jerry's, pick him up with with his daughter uh, Sunshine Kesey and Annabelle, and and he's like, "Let's go see Blue Velvet." It's playing like one theater in the city. So we go into the city because I remember Jerry paid for it. And he had this like wallet that was like hanging on by like three threads. <laughs> he bought he bought our tickets, and I, I don't know. I was like sixteen. Annabelle was probably like. 15 you know we're all we're all kind of in that same teenage era and um we sat and watched blue velvet and i just remember dad and jerry like discussing the finer nuances of of blue velvet all the way home and that's how i discovered david lynch and uh, obviously a consummate filmmaker and then the funny part is later i told yorma kalkin in the story he's like yeah i don't really like blue velvet it's just not weird enough for me wow awesome dude and also another funny blue velvet story is right after that. This was this was we were when did we do in the dark? It was the spring of eighty seven. Yes, spring of eighty seven. So when they played with Dylan in July, I'm so not David Lemieux in July of eighty seven. <laughs> 
um, Dennis Hopper came to the show mm -hmm. and he was walking around. He's like, it's really weird. I've never met so many people into Blue Velvet because everybody was like, oh, my God, Blue Velvet, you're the coolest. Uh. And so like weirded out, you know, Dennis Hopper. So that is that is really saying something because his work in that movie is as weird as it gets. That scene um, with them on the floor in the apartment, the sex scene is just about as weird a sex scene as you'll see in American film, I would say. So that's oh, it's really so saying something. And then the funny part is Jerry starts talking. He's like, hey, Dennis, do you remember you took photos of us in the 60s? And apparently when the Grateful Dead were in L.A., one of the photographers came by was Dennis Hopper. And Jerry remembered him from uh, the James Dean movies. And he's like, oh, my God, wow. you're, you're the actor from, from uh, Rebel Without a Car. Uh, you know, it's like da da da. And this is, before, this is before Easy Rider, obviously. And, yep. um, and Jerry was just enamored with him. So, like, I, I think I think Dennis had forgotten that story. So he's like, oh, yeah, man, don't you remember? You, you took those photos of us in 67. So, that is that wild. That is wild. Jesus. Well, um, as much as I would love to just continue to dive deep into our uh, shared appreciation of various films and filmmakers, I would like to talk about your project, uh, Let There Be Drums, because I'm such a big fan of it. I enjoyed it so oh, much. Thank you. Thank um, you. So the film, it opens with, I think, an original composition in the background. It sounds like a beam, and then you get the definition of drummer um, as like the the first image that we see in the movie. Um, and then it fades away to show just the last four words, unconventional thought or action. How did where Do you remember where you came up with that idea? Because I think it's a really compelling opening sequence, and it's something that really grabs you and locks you into what you're about to watch. I think I was look, just looking for some way to start it. And like drummer is something I've never Googled or uh, for those of you who are a little older, I've never looked in a dictionary to actually see like what, what the, what the technical term for what a drummer does. And when I saw that, I'm like, all right, game over. That, that's how we're starting <laughs> it. Like that, that, that just yeah, like, I couldn't have written a better. Yes. And that is, that is probably some beam under there. Uh, I had two really good guys that did the score. Sebastian Robertson and Danielle Davies, who um, uh, also have the famous father card because Sebastian's dad is Robbie Robertson and Daniel's dad is Dave Davies from the Kings. That's so, crazy. <laughs> quite unexpectedly, it's like the famous father slash nepotism has privileges <laughs> group of filmmakers. I go. love I love the scoring that they did for the film. The 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 like kind of flip side of that at the end, Mickey has that great quote. You know, you have a voiceover and then it goes to Mickey talking about, you know, the dawn of the universe. And yeah. um, then you have this cool, it's not quite a needle drop, but the way the beat drops on the score when you, it kicks into the fi final credits, the ending credits, I thought was also just excellent. Such a cool high note to end on. Yeah, no, they did great. And also there's uh, there's a little Neil Casal in there. He, I had put oh. some of the music that he had done for uh, Fare Thee Well, which uh, the, it became called Circles Around the Sun. Um, is that right? Circles on the Sun, yes. Mm -hmm. Which was actually thought up by Annabelle Garcia because she thought it would look cool because you could have cats on like a hat and people would be like, what is that? Oh, circles around the sun. I'm like, oh, cool. Like, like they all love that. They're like, oh, that's genius. Like, anyway, um, I had laid some of his music in uh, as temp before Sebastian and Daniel got a hold of it. And, saw, and a few of those cues, uh, particularly when we were showing Grateful Dead stuff, um, they were just like, yeah, this is kind of perfect. What, let's not mess with it. So uh, yeah, it, it it's worked. Sebastian and Daniel and, and a little Neil Casal. Great. Uh, yeah, I, I really liked that aspect of it. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question and send it to Dave sure. to ask you a couple. So um, I read that you started working on this project in earnest in 2019. But when I was watching the movie, it seemed like a nugget of inspiration may have come during Fare Thee Well in 2015. When and how did the original like base nugget of the idea for this for this movie come to you? Well, it, it um, we use fairly well in there. I, I I honestly can't remember if I was actively. I mean, this is probably something I've been thinking about for like my, half my life at least. I I don't know if I was actively involved in tr figuring out how to do this during fairly well, but fairly well kind of as as I'm sure it did with. Uh, anybody who watched it or listened to it or was there, you know, such a, you know, celebration, grateful mm -hmm. dead, thinking of the past, people who aren't here anymore, you know, will you ever see these guys all together play, you know, all, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So it just had that, it, it if, 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 if I wasn't actively thinking of this particular project, it just stirred up enough stuff that it, it wasn't 
too much of a stretch to then kind of kick this into gear with the uh, the kindness of um, the producers and all that kind of stuff. But fairly well, that was kind of the last, you know, I mean, just because it was a, a Grateful Dead celebration and it mm-hmm. sort of wasn't an ongoing idea like Dead and Company or something like that. Gotcha. I have a couple of questions about like the drummers in the film. I mean, sure. Ringo Starr comes to mind. Did you know Ringo before the movie? Did your dad set up a connection? I mean, how did you connect with some of these? I mean, top 10 drummers of all time. Well, Ringo, I had only met once and it was so incredibly awesome. And this is the most na- I like I I don't know how to tell the story without just being particularly name droppy. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that used to represent uh, Judy Belushi and John Belushi and the Blues Brothers also uh, manages Todd Rundgren. Todd Rundgren oh. was in the Ringo Star and the All Stars. And one day Ringo's playing in LA and I had told him how much, you know, I love the Ringo and the Beatles. And he's like, hey, can you get up here right now? And I'm like, sure. He's like, yeah, do you want to come see Ringo sound check? I'm like, like you oh, know, yeah. by the time he, by the time he set set down the phone, my car was screeching out back of <laughs> the auditorium. So I go in and he's like doing boys, and it's like me and two people in the empty auditorium watching Ringo Star. And I'm just like, yeah, this just totally rocks. This totally there's like, you know, it's sound check. So at the end, I'm standing on the side of the stage just trying to be invisible. And Joe Walsh is there, and it's just total rock and roll. And so I, I get introduced to Ringo. And this is like the first time that I ever felt bad about not being a drummer. He's like, so Justin, do you play? My sons play. And I just, I just so wanted to be like, yeah, man, I love the drums. Da, 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 da. And he was like super sweet. And it's just, you know, it's, I have very much the reaction that like Chad Smith has that you see in the movie. It's yeah. just sort of like, I've, I've, I've met a couple famous people in my life, but you know, I finally met a Beatle. I mean, I'm friends with with their, some of their kids, but and, and it, which that that's that's a whole other realm of of, of coolness. But yeah, yeah no, uh, and he was like super sweet, and so you know, I can't I can't say that if he saw me on the street, he'd be like, "Hey, Justin, how you doing?" But you know, uh, just to have any time in his presence w- was awesome. And my friend Danny Clinch, the legendary filmmaker Danny Clinch, had been shooting a. Uh, John Barbados commercial. And so the story that you hear Chad tell about playing Ringo's beats, that's why we have that 16 millimeter film uh, that it cuts to uh, was, was from Danny. So we, we oh. had that amazing story of Chad talking about the commercial he's filming and the footage of the commercial We had all the outtakes with Ringo drumming and all that stuff. So, so I, I, cool. uh, give, give props or props are due Danny Clinch, legendary Danny Clinch. So. Wow. Wow. So in that scene, so I would assume because you've worked with the Who, you would have worked with Zach Starkey um, at some point, right? Because he's been the drummer yeah. for the Who for a long time. In fact, I saw, I just saw Zach about an hour ago here in Los Angeles. But yes, I, I worked with Zach for about two years when I worked with uh, Pete and Rachel Townsend uh, doing a project called In the Attic. And Pete, the Who needed a video guy, and I was already out on the road with, with Pete and Rachel. And so Pete kind of sublet me to the Who. So oh. I got to, I got to do, I got to do it all. When That's I was really there. cool. So was it when at the end of that clip with Ringo, he says, I've got to do something really quick for my son. And then he plays like <laughs> just this little fill or something. Was that for Zach or his other son? I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. I've always been meaning to ask because I, I couldn't, I didn't recognize uh, it was some inside thing, but it just, yeah. just because he said son, it was so perfect. And it's, you know, yeah, the way he an ended it moment. Yeah. Seriously. So, really yeah, was. no, no, that, that's just all. And you, you kind of build to Ringo. Like, like as I was putting this together, people were always like, yeah, we were kind of waiting for Ringo, waiting for Ringo because everyone's talking about him. And then he comes <laughs> and then it's like, oh, Ringo, he's there. Awesome. Yeah. No, that is really cool. Definitely incredible. Um, another, well, father son is the big theme of the movie, but another father son is Jason Bonham talking about how he didn't get his dad's music until he was a little bit older Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um does that resonate with you as well is that your experience with your dad's music or has your appreciation for it kind of always been there from the start well i i I would have to be bold enough to say i think that's just sort of a across the board i mean it's like the thing your dad does and it's like you you know uh, have you ever met anybody like 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 a a, a son or daughter of standing on the side of the stage doing like fist pumps going yeah dad i mean that's not cool right i mean like you know what i mean i mean who does that 
you know, <laughs> but if you have to have a self, a, a health, a healthy sense of self deprecation. And also, you know, you see this guy in the morning, you know, and around the house. So uh, at, it's funny at the Q and a, they're like, you grew up with rock gods. And I'm like, you know what? At eight in the morning when they're making you cereal, they're not rock gods. All right. You know, they're dead. <laughs> so it's all cool. But I always loved Grateful Dead music. Um, but you know, people, people always mistakenly were not always, but some people would always be like, so yeah, you must be a deadhead. And I'm like, it would kind of be insulting to deadheads. Like I never had to like work to get to a show. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I never had to like suffer to get my ticket or wait in line or have a bad, like, you know, I, I like w- was in the limo or the van and then the plane and like just sitting like 20 feet from like, I, I, I had the most easy, pleasurable experience at Grateful Dead show. So, I mean, to me, a deadhead is somebody who really just loves the music and, and does what they need to do to get there to see it and be involved. So I always figured that like, I would be insulted if I was like a deadhead, like people were calling me that because <laughs> You know, it's not like me and the other kids, it's not like we put in our time or anything. <laughs> well, in in other ways you did though. I think it's it's interesting. Um, the interviews with Rhea Hart in the movie and, and her talking about the music too. Um, I thought that was also interesting. It's also kind of cool to me how many of the various kids of all the members of that band have become artists in their own right. I think that yeah. that's relatively unique and and just I don't know, I think it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, it, I it, I think it, any scene where where creativity is encouraged, um, I mean, you're gonna you're you're gonna find that. And it's like you know what a blessing. I mean, yeah, can you just I, I I don't even want to imagine when it's like somebody's like yeah, you should go to a nine to five job. Not that people don't enjoy that and it's not a great living, mm-hmm. or you know, but it's it's you know the the it's just you know when people offer you complete artistic freedom to you know to do what you believe in. I mean, what what a, what a gift. Yeah, it would have been wrong too if that's what your parents would have all been like. Hey guys, I know that this is what we did, but you really need to go get into finance. I think that that's the right move. <laughs> and, well, um, it'd, it'd be like, yeah, the Grateful Dead told us not to smoke pot. Yeah, yeah, they were all down on us about weed. Yeah, you'd just be like, well, that's wrong. Like that's not right. Yeah, it destroys all my myths. Oh man. Yeah. Um. So, uh, we only have a couple more minutes with you. We just have a couple more questions. One is. As, by my count, I think four of the people that you interviewed for this film have since passed away. Um, Jesus, is, I know it's like it's just a death. This movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes Jesus. it it makes it really special to hear from them um, in this medium. I think, and I love it when people that we've lost get to live on through stories that we tell about them. So, if you know, given this is a Grateful Dead podcast, uh, I'm wondering if you would share a story that comes to mind when you think of Brent Midland, uh, someone who left us a long time ago, but who was obviously in your dad's band for a long while. I'm sure you crossed paths with many, many times. Yes, yes. Brent Midland, um, who just celebrated a birthday uh, right. recently. I always wanted, he was buried in, he had this Rolex watch that he just loved and he was buried in it. And, <laughs> and when you're at the funeral, you could hear it ticking. And oh, so man. we're, we're all, oh, wow. all deciding like how long the, the yeah, open caskets. That that's a whole other that, that's not that cool. Yeah. Anyway, uh Brent was super sweet. I've got two Brent, I'll give you two. Okay. Um uh because this ties back to Apocalypse. I had just started doing or wanting to do music videos with Gio Coppola, who was Francis Coppola's oldest son. Right. And we were gonna do a, a video with a guy, he backed out like at the last minute. And so I don't know why I didn't ask before, but I said, hey, dad, is there any way you can find, do you know any musicians? Hey, dad, do you know anybody <laughs> that plays? And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, we can get somebody. So he called Brent and a couple other guys and Brent l- l- brought in an original song and they did, the, we did this video called Nobody's. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it was in base and that band morphed into Go Ahead, um, I think oh. in Kokomo. And, and that, that, that's how that, uh, when Jerry was in his coma, that's how that band first all got together. Interesting. Uh, unfortunately, Gio Coppola died like like a, like a month af- after we did that video. It was oh, like man. he totally yeah, it was in Washington, and I was in Washington, and that's when Jerry went to his coma for the Dylan Dead Petty show. Anyway, it's all oh, weirdly, weirdly connected. Um, yeah, that's and a so, crazy one. I I remember when I first got into. Francis Coppola's movies and it's just like wait and he has a daughter who's also a filmmaker and what, oh, what Sophia's is this guy's great. family yeah she her her movies are awesome and I read about uh Gio's I mean really tragic death at such a young age and was just like oh god that is 
really sad. Any stories about Gio having worked with him and, you know, he was one of your friends that we can kind of have him live on uh, through, through stories. Yeah. Well, I mean, Gio was like my hero. That's why I put him in. I put as many shots of him as I could in the movie. He's six years older than me, but he still let me like run around and ask him all those like questions about, you know, why his dad did this and how his dad did that. And, that's he did cool. those beautiful montages in the Cotton Club. Um, there's two sequences. Uh, they're really, really beautiful. Uh, they're just really inspiring. He, he was he was just a really great guy. And he died right before that, that 86 summer tour. And this is a story I never tell, but it, it's it's worth telling. So we're on this private plane, right? And we're flying into Cincinnati. And if you, anybody's seen the movie Almost Famous, you know that part where they almost crash? Yeah. And like everybody, everybody's like shouting out their, their stuff. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the back with Annabelle, Taro Hart and Jerry sitting across from us in the window and the pilot comes back says strap in we're going through a thunderstorm oh my and gosh. I'm like oh that's like the last famous last words like oh great right so like we all strap in we lightning's bouncing off the wing we're like turning sideways and Jerry looks over me cigarette in hand he's like yeah well you know it's just death you're gonna <laughs> live you're gonna die and he starts to tell me about the car accident he was in when he was 24 and wow. surviving and near death and I'm like wow I'm going to die and like Jerry's going to sort of take me through it. But like no one's going to know I'm on the plane because it's going to be Grateful Dead and family. <laughs> die. Oh, so no. it's like not even good. So, you know, we, we obviously we made it. But I just remember because he was saying, oh, man, really sorry to hear about Gio. I knew a guy like that. You know, Paul Spiegel. When I, anyway, he was just tying it into his whole his his life. And um, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that was my summer of 86. But uh, Gio, <laughs> Gio was great. Um, he has his daughter. It's also a filmmaker, Gia Coppola. Um, oh. So it it, uh, it go it continues. Very cool. Well, what Beautiful. about us? I mean, you've told us a couple of great stories about Jerry, but any story that comes to mind about him, um, other than the, the that excellent one that you just told? Well, I've got a funny one. Um, when uh, I never like to repeat myself, but this this was a particularly good one. We were really bored. One day when we were making, I guess, you know, I don't, I don't want to dispel any myths, but, you know, when you're making a record, it's not always the most exciting thing ever. I can so imagine, it was me, yeah. me and Jerry and John Cutler at the front street. And we had to take tapes to San Francisco for some reason. I don't remember why, but it was rush hour traffic. And anybody from the Bay Area, you know, is getting across the Golden Gate Bridge from Marin at rush hour. Forget about it. So we're like, oh, let's take the ferry. So, mm. you know, we jump on with all the businessmen, tapes under Cutler's arm. It's me, Jerry, and we're getting ready to get off get off the boat. And I've got this that, those 1987 big old Grateful Dead sweatshirts that say GD with like a lightning bolt. It's like huge. It's like, you know, the way people made clothes in the 80s. And the guy literally leaning against Jerry's shoulder looks over and goes, hey, is that a Grateful Dead shirt? And we see Jerry just look down. <laughs> he knows it's coming. He's like, oh, God. Da, da, da. And the guy's like, I'm a huge fan. And then he like walks off the boat. <laughs> Jerry looks up over his glasses, and goes, Yeah, big fan. <laughs> he's like the f- literally like the guy like was touching him. He had no idea, but he was oh a big gosh. fan. That's too funny. <laughs> wow. Oh man. Um, the next project is a film about Jerry Garcia, but we won't get into that right now. Maybe, maybe when that one comes out, you can come back and we can talk about that down the road. Of course, of course. Well, um, one last thing, it's not even a question, but on your Vimeo page, there's a really great video of Roger Daltrey telling you how he gets warmed up for concerts and playing a song that is just for you. Uh, I don't have a question. That's just the coolest fact I've ever gotten to tell someone about themselves. And so I wanted to make sure that I got a chance to say that because the Who is my first favorite band. Uh, something about Quadrophenia just like grabbed me to my core when I was a when I was a kid, um, and I've I've loved them ever since. So I think that it's I mean that video I was watching and just thinking I know that you were a fan of the Who. Um, I'm sure you were growing up, and so that must have been like so freaking cool. I'm still a fan of the Who. But what's so funny is like I literally just had coffee with Rachel Fuller Townsend this morning, and while we're sitting there at the Sunset Marquee, Roger walked in. So hey, Roger, good to see you again. He looked <laughs> wow. at me like, "Who are you?" I'm like, "Oh, we toured together for like two years. It's all good." <laughs> Bill Curtis was there, and that's Zach Starkey came down with his beautiful new daughter. So like I just had I just had a full Who morning. So I'm just like in. No, the Who the Who are awesome. I re- I remember. The um, day on the Green Show, and oh, yeah. I got to see, I got to see the original Who, and I have this memory, and I and I'm always questioning my own. You know, I was six, six or seven. I don't know what I knew about the Who, 
but I remember hiding behind my dad's leg and him pulling me out saying, this is Keith. He's the drummer for the who. And I remember Keith bent down and shook my hand. And when you're like a little kid, that's just like so awesome that somebody yeah. would one take the time, but like he would like get on your level. And mm-hmm. then I remember watching the who set on my dad's shoulders. Cause I could see the who stenciled on Pete Townsend's amps <laughs> and feeling like it was literally the loudest thing I had ever heard in my life. Um, but it wasn't until rock palace when I saw them at rock palace when I was 11. That's when I was like, yeah, this is the band for me. Wow. That wow. is a really great induction to the who um, me listening on my, my Sony Walkman to the CD of quadrophenia, not quite as visceral, <laughs> I don't think, but it still, it still moved me. So whatever they were doing, they were, they were doing it. Well, right. and also you gotta, you gotta realize uh, growing up, my, my perception of who was cool and who wasn't was based a lot about like the members of the grateful dead mm-hmm. and the, who were one of those bands that like, even Phil Lesh thought was really cool and respected. And you're just like, oh, okay. It's just like, you know, it sort of like gave you that stamp of approval that, oh, you know, like the dead like them. So they must be really good. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, uh, the Who are one of those bands that everybody in the dead loved. That's so. cool. There's there's a book that Bob Dylan just put out called like the modern philosophy of song or something like that. And he goes through like 50 songs and, you know, he wrote what he thought was cool about them. And one of them is trucking. And I, I kind of felt that of like, Bob, I mean, I love the dead, obviously, and I really like Bob Dylan, but Bob Dylan has kind of taken this like elder statesman position in modern music, right? Where it's like when he gives someone the stamp of approval, it's like, and obviously he gave the dead a stamp of approval decades ago, but he talks about your dad and Phil and says like, it's the greatest rhythm section that's ever been. And you're not going to get better than those guys. And Bob is like this unique, great rhythm guitarist. And just hearing it, I was like, man, that's still so freaking cool that, you know, after all these years, Bob is still loving their music as much as all of the heads are i know how, how how awesome is that i mean it's like yeah i mean geez it's dylan i mean yeah. he it's you know every you know an, another person again who but l- less of a surprise probably but yeah everybody yeah. is like you know bob it's all bob. good yeah all right justin well thank you so much for uh, being so generous with your time today again huge congratulations on the film it's so great um and uh good luck with your future projects i hope that tomorrow goes well Get that speech ready for the Oscar. It's coming um, <laughs> Thanks, tomorrow <guys>. night. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, cheers. Have a good weekend. All right. Thank you for having me. Yep, of course. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. So, Dave, there it is. Our interview with uh, Justin Kreutzman. What a just fun-loving, high-energy dude. And we are so grateful to get just a fraction of his time for him to just indulge us and share those stories. That was great. Absolutely. And a great storyteller. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you can see why it, it comes through in the documentary so well, because he's able to just capture you with a quick 10 second story. So he, when he paints a picture on the screen, it's equally as captivating. Yeah. You're so right about that. I, I think one thing that I thought was so cool about the way that he constructed this film was kind of like you I think you said this before we got him on the line the family aspect of the film like being such a focal point in it and one of the things that he said in he did a great interview with relics that I'll post in our show notes but he was talking about how um the film that he had originally pitched was not this not this movie and it kind of showed itself to him as he was making it he had this um the interview with Taylor Hawkins rest in peace um where Taylor, it's in the final product. He says, this is probably not for the documentary, but was your home life stable (laughs) growing up? (laughs) And uh, Justin said that that was like the aha moment of like, well, that's what this film is. Um, And so the way that he kind of sprinkles breadcrumbs before he really gets into the meat of that, there's a part where I think it's Adrian Young or someone else where they're like, I think 99% of drummers come from odd family situations, maybe not Mm -hmm. the most stable homes. And then you trace it all the way through these inter- the interview with Mandy Moon, um, Keith Moon's daughter, where she's talking about that. Jason Bonham, Kofi Baker says the same thing. Like it's just over and over again. All of these people are reiterating these same points, and the way that he constructs that story and kind of guides you through it is just excellent. It's such such great filmmaking. Yeah, absolutely. I guess I thought it would be when I went into it more of a like history of how rock and roll drumming came to be. Mm -hmm. So that was my expectation when I clicked play just from the title, right? Like let there be drums. That was my expectation from the title. And it very quickly turned into 
this is not a movie about drumming. This is a movie about family that had drummers. Yes, I agree with you. And we do get a little bit of the history of rock and roll. You know, we get like the Sandy Nelson, the let there be drums and these early yep. rock tracks and, um, uh, little and Richard's how that drummer. influenced people, you know, future yeah. drummers over time. Yeah, we do yep. get that. Um, but it's just not in the traditional way. Uh, it's so much more interesting and nuanced than that. And I think that that's part of what makes it such a, such a great movie. Um, I hope that you will all watch it because it, it really is excellent. And also, you know, this, you know, Justin as an artist poured years of his life into making it. So, yeah. you know, it's worth going to check out and, and seeing, um, you know, what he did with it. Cause it is really great. All right. Any final notes um, before we sign off? This is going to be a short episode. Any days between you want to talk about or anything like that? Um, actually, uh, sure. Taking All right. Well then hit it. the music. <laughs> No, I just thought it was really fitting that taking um, the dogs on a walk right before this to tire them out. There's like a 13 or 14 year old kid um, who was in the garage part of the apartment complex playing drums, like in the garage, um, like in their personal garage. And I was walking them and I was like, huh, how fitting that we're going to go interview the guy who made a movie about, you know, drumming and all that. It was just very, very fitting That is to, to see that knowing what we were about to do. What about you? So, Mine, the Bob Dylan book that I mentioned with Justin, it came out last week. So I'd, I'd pre-ordered it, the audiobook and just forgot about it. And then I was going to listen to a different audiobook and was like, oh, that's a surprise. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. So I went to the chapters because I had seen that there was a chapter on trucking and that's obviously the first thing I wanted to see. And I just scrolled down and was like, uh, I'll try chapter 30. And chapter 30 was about trucking. Oh, so wow. that was a weird moment of like, um, <laughs> I was like, whoa, what's going on here? But it is really great. I mean, I, I think that you would deeply agree with Bob about this, but he's like, the lyrics to this song are just like as good as song lyrics get. And he starts breaking down like his favorite ones. And he's like, you know, arrows of neon and flashing marquees out on main street. And he's like going through all this stuff and he's like, it's just like, so well written and it did bring yeah. me back to the story that that our buddy jonathan told us when we talked about vanita how he met bob hunter and talked about how he was so influential on him on his songwriting mm -hmm. and bob hunter told him without dylan there wouldn't be any of us or something like right. that <laughs> so yeah shout out to um jonathan and the broke down podcast that, that was a great story i think about it often and when i was hearing that part of you know, Bob Dylan praising Bob Hunter as a songwriter. It was the first thing I thought of. So yeah, that's the days between for me. Okay. Well, we've got a, a pretty busy schedule coming up with episodes. Dave has a busy life schedule, <laughs> but, um, but that's the, not going to stop us from <laughs> critiquing and raving about Dave's picks 44, which just hit my mailbox yesterday. Right. And then also a little fall 72 episode coming up as well yes and a long lost episode could be coming out soon mm. as well uh, i'll you know we'll tell you more about that when it's coming but um yeah for sure our next episode will be about dave's picks 44 so stay tuned for that thank you again to justin kreutzman for joining us and on that note we will bid you good night that's it that's it you got it <laughs>